Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to tonight's uh, event. Uh, my name is Kevin Featherstone, and I'm director of the Hellenic Observatory. Tonight's event is organized by the Hellenic Observatory, and I'd like to thank my colleagues for their organization uh, for tonight's uh, event. It is a very great pleasure, in general, but also personally, uh, to welcome our guest this evening, Yorgos Yerapatritis. Uh, Yorgos Yerapatritis is a distinguished academic professor of law at the University of Athens. He was educated in Athens, Edinburgh, and uh, Oxford. Uh, he's been a visiting fellow at Oxford. Rather more importantly, he's been a visiting fellow at the Hellenic Observatory at the LSE. Nobody's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and I simply note, actually, Yorga, that uh, not long after being a visiting professor at the uh, Hellenic Observatory, he was appointed minister in the government. Uh, the LSE prides itself on knowing the causes of things, and I think we can take some pride that after the fellowship, he went on to hire things uh, in government. Uh, he, as an academic, has published extensively. Uh, I've certainly admired his work uh, for a number of uh, years on a range of uh, topics. Uh, he's published some eight books, over 100 articles. Um, and in different languages uh, as well. But as I say, after visiting the Hellenic Observatory, then he was appointed into government as Minister of State, as you, uh, many of you will remember. And then this year, he became uh, Foreign Minister of the Hellenic uh, Republic. So this evening, we'll be talking about the challenges and opportunities facing Greek foreign policy. Uh, it's a highly topical agenda at these difficult times in the region and events uh, in the uh, area that we will be uh, coming on to. And um, I'm then going to open up the proceedings to you, the audience, to ask your uh, questions. And I'll try to take as many uh, questions as we reasonably uh, can. We must finish by uh, 8.30. One or two uh, organizational points. Tonight's event is being recorded, and all being well, we will make the uh, recording available uh, for download from the Hellenic Observatory website uh, later. Uh, if you wish to make uh, comments on Twitter, formerly known as X, then uh, you can do so uh, using the hashtag, hashtag LSE uh, Greece. Uh, and I'm sure you will enjoy uh, this evening, given the uh, eminence of our, our guest. Uh, but just to make doubly sure you enjoy this evening, you're all invited to a wine reception in the foyer after the lecture uh, this evening in the, uh, immediately outside the, uh, the door. Uh, so, uh, a lot to discuss, and we look forward to your questions and contributions uh, as well. But can you please join me to uh, begin by welcoming the Foreign Minister of the Hellenic Republic, Yorgos Yerapatritis. Thank you very much for making the time to come because I know that uh, George, uh, I'm going to call you George, um, I know that George's schedule is extremely busy and he has some early starts uh, in the morning. Uh, so we very much appreciate you making uh, the time. Let's try to cover a range of topics if we, if we may. Um, perhaps the first thing we should uh, just uh, uh, address is that I'm conscious that Every time the Prime Minister comes to London, people start talking about the Parthenon marvels. Uh, and you're a professor of law, the difficulty of the, of the negotiations with the British Museum, I'm sure must have crossed your desk on occasions. Um, rumors. Rumors. Uh, the serious question is, uh, what kind of progress do you think has been made on the return of the Parthenon marvels? This is, this is Kevin's idea of how we start easily. <laughs> <laughs> Not getting in the hardcore of, of uh, questions. Thank you so much for inviting me here. It's a great uh, pleasure and honor to be here at uh, the Hellenic Observatory. And I would like personally to thank Kevin, because 
He's always been uh, here for me and for many other students. I'm delighted to see some of my former colleagues and some of my former students. And it's always emotional. And um, actually, thank you, because um, through this invitation, I got away from many other events that I had to go tonight. So thank you. It's uh, wonderful. Um, and I also brought my LSE ID, because ah. <laughs> no, you don't, you don't have to upload. I just wanted to avoid any sort of entry checks. Um, so um, the sculptures. This is a difficult issue. Um, and the truth is that um, we need to develop a, an understanding of uh, each other. Um, it's been the, the discussion forever. Um, last four years, uh, we made a significant progress when it came to discussions with the British Museum. We had a very constructive um, series of discussions with the British Museum uh, and with uh, George Osborne, uh, the um, president of the Board of Trustees. We both know that there are specific restrictions, Kevin, uh, statutory restrictions, because the uh, UK law prohibits the accession of the uh, sculptures. On the other hand, um, I think it's about time that we find a proper solution in order to allow the sculptures to come back to, to Athens, to the Acropolis uh, Museum. Um, we could do this through a broader uh, uh, partnership between uh, the Acropolis Museum and the British Museum that would involve not only the exchange of, of uh, artifacts uh, and the coming back of, of the partner sculptures, but also uh, other research activities and activities concerning common understanding um, and raising awareness about the uh, specificities of, of uh, the Greek antiquity and probably the Byzantine uh, uh, civilization. So it's important to develop that type of uh, partnership. Now, uh, we consider that um, the sculptures should come back to Athens. I think there are two grounds, uh, and I'm not speaking very regularly about these sculptures, uh, but I think there are two grounds why they should come back, and I always encourage people to uh, read um, a very uh, significant book, um, Who Owns History, by uh, Jeffrey Robertson. Um, and I think you can find all the arguments there. First of all, I think it's important to actually have great uh, arts and great pieces of, of civilization exactly in the place they were born. It's important. Um, and secondly, I think especially the Parthenon sculptures they constitute a unity, uh, uh, and it's important to unite, to reunificate the, the uh, sculptures. It's not as if it's um, you know like some 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 segments of antiquity. It's a totality, mm. and totality should be the, together. Um, as Aristotle used to say, the whole is more than its pieces, its uh, segments. And you know, for example, the uh, the frieze. Uh, the frieze is um, a, a single totality. You cannot separate the, the frieze because it represents, as you know, um, the, um, the festival of, of uh, Greater Panathenia. Mm -hmm. It's uh, a series of events. There is uh, a sequence of events presented uh, on the um, frieze. And uh, now 80 meters of the frieze is here in the British Museum. 60 meters is in the Acropolis Museum. There are some other parts at the Louvre and um, other museums. We need to uh, reunite them. And I'm sure the most in the audience here would be very sympathetic uh, to that case. The and most of the UK citizens, I would And the most of the UK uh, citizens, uh, absolutely. Uh, but that kind of arrangement, where there's collaboration between the British Museum and its peer in Athens, and potential research collaboration uh, as well. Uh, do you think that can happen whilst avoiding issues of ownership? We need to downgrade the issue of ownership. We know that we have a, a, a totally different point of, of uh, starting point. So we need to accept each other's position, to um, keep it in, a, in, in the sphere of vagueness, and then uh, proceed to uh, another arrangement. And I clearly think 
that we can find a, a sustainable legal solution within the boundaries of the uh, 1963 UK law um, and just acknowledge the fact that we have a different perception of, of uh, ownership and it has happened in the past. I would like to remind you, Kevin, that um, just a, a few months ago we had the return of uh, four parts of the Parthenon of the frieze from uh, the Vatican, yes. and as you probably know, the French uh, National Assembly voted in favor of returning uh, significant artifacts of antiquity to Benin. So I think there is a general tendency to, to, to return significant cultural heritage um, species to their birthplaces, and I think there is this momentum ongoing. And would you envisage that um the return of these sculptures to Athens would be for a defined period, or how long might we be talking about? Now you act as a journalist. <laughs> <laughs> this is not an academic question. What's a disgraceful thing to say to you? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the, the, um, there is a fine tuning that we have to do, and to be totally honest, Kevin, we're still rather far away from having a, a fully fledged agreement. Okay. Um, so we haven't defined this. I am relatively optimistic. Unfortunately, I heard just coming here um, a statement by um, the government's uh, spokesperson that uh, the uh, sculptures are better off here. Um, I have to say that the, the sculptures and that type of, of art is always better off when they are in uh, their birthplace. And I am very emotional when I'm saying this, but uh, you know, like there are, there are a million of people waiting for the, for, for example, for the frieze to be uh, reunited and for the sixth Karyatid to come back to Athens. It's important because there are five Karyatids and there's their sister living here and we just need to um, uh, reunite the, the, the sculptures. I presume that some of you have already visited the Acropolis Museum and you can feel how emotional one can get when they actually see that there are the five Karyatids and they're just holding the erection and there is one missing. And I think it's important for the whole of the cultural civilization to try and reunite the, the, the uh, sculptures. Okay, let's move on to questions of... Uh, I'm sure you will come back to this. Okay, I mean, I'm sure the audience may wish to come back to these uh, questions as well, but let's move on to matters of uh, foreign policy. I noticed last week... I expected this. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I noticed last week that the uh, International Institute for uh, Strategic Studies uh, published a report where it described the Eastern Mediterranean as, quote, a strategic flashpoint. And it called the Eastern Mediterranean a flashpoint because it uh, identified the United States retreating from the region while Russia and China were becoming more uh, prominent. And it identified some 20 years uh, of accumulated tensions within uh, the region. So I, I guess the question for a foreign minister from Greece would be, what can Greece do to contribute to greater stability within the region? What are you doing to stabilize an unstable region? I stay awake. <laughs> That's the first thing to say, because I haven't slept for ages. Um, in fact, since I took over the post, which needs to be a sleepless post, um, obviously I was unlucky, though, because all these incidents happened on my duty. Mm. Um, the truth is that uh, it's probably the most volatile region uh, now in the globe. Um, and the other truth is that um, the last decades, I feel that, the, that we completely underestimated the southern neighborhood. Uh, because there are a lot happening now, not only in the Middle East, but also there is a series of negative activities um, in Africa, or, not only Maghreb, but also sub-Saharian uh, Africa, Sahel. If one sees the situation in, in Sahel, it's, it's uh, horrific. It's really scary because there are, there are no uh, enclaves of democracy. It's, it's only authoritarian regimes, civil wars, um, things happening against any sort of, of uh, rule of law, democratic legitimacy. Um, there is a, a huge danger of food insecurity. 
um, there is a, a truly a minefield uh, in our neighborhood. So um, I think now we have to refocus, we have to revisit our principles, and we have to place particular emphasis on, uh, on this region. At least we're doing relatively well with uh, Turkey now. Uh, now, what Greece could do? I think we could do a lot of things. Um, primarily because uh, Greece, although it's a rather small country, medium small, I would say, country, um, the truth is that it is geographically located at a very central and crucial point. But mostly, I think we have employed uh, a foreign policy of, of uh, fundamental principles, which is solid and coherent. And that enables Kevin to be um, very um, reliable partners and discussions with all the key actors. Uh, last week, I visited Ramallah, and I met with the uh, Palestinian Prime Minister and the Palestinian Foreign Minister. And then I went to West Jerusalem, and I met with uh, the um, Israeli Foreign Minister. And I tried to be as constructive as possible to convey all the uh, requests and all the fears. And I think I was very productive. I'm not saying that the uh, humanitarian pause was exactly because of me, but the thing is that we were a lot of people who tried a lot in order to establish that humanitarian pause, and we hope that this would produce further momentum. But I think we are very solid with our foreign policy. We could operate as uh, interlocutors. For a long time, Greece has been very close to the Arabic world, and now we have a key strategic partnership with uh, Israel. So. Uh, we are, I think, very reliable. Now we are trying further to, um, to extend the humanitarian pause. Just a couple of hours uh, before coming to uh, this room, I heard that there is going to be a two-day humanitarian pause extension uh, in order to allow for further hostages and prisoners to be set free, which is really uh, outstanding. But there, there are still a lot of things that we need to do. First and outmost, we need to work for the day after. I think it's imperative that we work for the permanent solution in uh, the Middle East. And obviously, we need to actually provide further humanitarian help. Because um, what is actually happening now is uh, indeed on the verge of humanitarian crisis. And not only in Gaza, we, there is some uh, uh, serious uh, situation now also in the West Bank and also in the southern Lebanon. So we need to try and establish long-term sustainable uh, humanitarian uh, aid and peace in the region. Oh. And we will, uh, we will work very hard for this. One of the things, one of the changes you're identified with uh, in becoming foreign minister is a softer approach via the Turkey. Um, ministers have their different styles. How would you identify the difference of approach to Turkey that you have brought? <clears throat> That's a tricky question. Um, what I would say is uh, that there is a window of opportunity to improve the Greek-Turkish relationship uh, now. Why there is a credible window of opportunity? Because first of all, we have two fresh governments, not exactly super fresh, but kind of uh, freshly mandated by the electorate. Um, so we do have those uh, new governments. Um, we do have two foreign ministers who are not exactly strong political actors. So for me, the idea of political cost has a completely different meaning from a, a hardcore politician because I will do whatever it takes to support my country and the, the uh, national interest of my country without relying on the political cost that um, this might incur. Um, the same happens with my Turkish counterpart. And then I think um, there is a, a good slot because we have two leaders who are really willing to improve. Uh, the bilateral relations. I think what makes the difference is um, that um, we're trying to have a mutual understanding of our differences. 
You know, Kevin, you know me well. I am very fond of the basic idea of deliberative mm. democracy and of uh, deliber deliberative processes, mm. uh, not only in foreign policy, but in everyday aspect of uh, life. So I think that if we just sit around the table and we stick by reason and uh, we have some, some uh, sincere uh, mindsets in uh, things, I think we will eventually find out a proper solution, and this is exactly what we're doing. Exactly because we have that type of mindset, both uh, myself and the uh, Turkish Foreign Minister, we have decided to essentially change the uh, political approach of things. There are many occasions where we're um, trying to solve problems by discussing at a higher level even for smaller things. So we, many times we employ a top-down approach, political approach, instead of a bottom-up approach that could pile up the tension. You know, the, what uh, the uh, journalists keep on asking me, what do you really expect from uh, the Greek-Turkish dialogue? And I, what I say is that I just aspire that any time we have a dispute, it doesn't eventually conclude in crisis. We have to discuss and uh, resolve issues, and um, you know things change, history changes, natural phenomena may come, but geography doesn't change. And we're set by Turkey, we're neighbors, and um, I really believe that uh, we should approach this uh, dialogue on a um, good faith uh, approach. But I wonder, what is it about Erdogan? Uh, that makes you feel that a uh, sensible, common sense uh, approach at this point uh, is feasible. Uh, when internationally, what do we identify with him? We identify an unpredictability, uh, values which we don't really uh, share. Uh, I'm just wondering, what are the reasons for optimism? in November 2023, which were not there two years ago? I think there is uh, a better understanding. And uh, we have jointly decided to leave aside our disputes. We do recognize that we have fundamental differences, both bilaterally and in terms of uh, regional policies. And you can see that in the Middle East, we have completely different uh, viewpoints. But this should not prevent us from discussing. And we have decided to focus not on those things who actually, which actually separate us, but on the things that actually uh, unite us. For example, we do have a very ambitious positive agenda. Uh, we do have agreements that will be signed in the near future concerning economy, tourism, uh, education, culture. Uh, we have to increase the awareness of, of uh, young people. We really believe, and I strongly believe, in people to people. Uh, diplomacy, we have to raise the awareness of people concerning um, the uh, good neighborly relations. I think there is a different uh, mindset, um, and I think we should focus on win-win uh, okay. uh, solutions, and that's why I'm working very hard with uh, my colleagues in order to live, develop the positive agenda for the 7th of December. Okay. Um... You mentioned quite rightly that Greece has developed a new relationship with Israel in recent years. Um, Erdogan, of course, has distinguished himself by saying that uh, by supporting Hamas. Problem. It is a problem. It is a problem, and um, this is something that we would never accept. We consider that uh, Hamas is a terrorist organization. And um, it is Hamas that triggered the situation on the, um, um, in October, the 7th of October. Um, and uh, I think that we should uh, just differentiate Hamas from the Palestinian people, because you know the Palestinian people, by all means, are not to blame for the current situation, and they need all our support, both the development and the humanitarian support. And our, or, uh, our overall political support. We, as you know, uh, Greece clearly supports the idea of the two-state solution within the um, spectrum of the uh, UN Security Council resolutions with uh, 
uh, East Jerusalem as capital city of, of the Palestinian state. We clearly support the Palestinian Authority, and I think it's important that we provide further legitimacy and leverage to the Palestinian Authority for the day after. Um, so we have completely different approaches when it comes to uh, the Middle East situation, but on the other hand, I think we should discuss about our uh, bilaterals. Um, and I think we should try and converge on uh, those things which are of, of uh, mutual benefit instead of uh, going into details about those things which are completely on the um, other side of, of, of uh, our understanding. Okay, and the conflict between Israel and uh, Gaza, could you say something about um, how threatening to Greece's interests you think that, that may be? I would say that it is threatening for the whole uh, Western uh, civilization in the sense that um, we have, th I would say, three problems. The first problem would be the economic problem, uh, because as you can imagine, a spillover effect in the Middle East could definitely uh, impose further uh, burdens upon the uh, world's economy. And Greece has recovered spectacularly, but still the global economy is rather volatile. Secondly, uh, we could accept a migration uh, flow. Um, there are a lot of people now on the verge of, of uh, a humanitarian crisis. There are people uh, in Gaza, which is the most dense region on Earth, uh, living under very adverse conditions. Um, so we could expect to have uh, immigration flows. This is a huge problem that we have uh, to address. We cannot in any case uphold any sort of uh, collective displacement. That would be clearly unacceptable. And the third danger would be obviously the spillover of terrorism in, uh, in the uh, West, um, which is something that we wouldn't like to uh, see. Um, Combating terrorism, I think, is as important as combating inequalities and, and um, deprivation of social cohesion. So I think we should have a global policy against terrorism as um, against any other sort of, of uh, human deficiency. Um, so I think those are the three dangers. We have to work globally. You know, we do encounter huge asymmetries, Kevin. What is really happening is that we do not have any sort of, of grammatical evolution of, of things. Everything is getting uh, asymmetrical. Um, everything is getting out of uh, prediction. It's difficult to do any sort of uh, foresighting. When I first uh, joined the government, one of my first ideas was to establish a new unit within the presence of the uh, government for, a, for, for, for foresighting in order to develop all kinds of what if of what ifs scenario for the future. Mm -hmm. And we tried to think about the medium term and the long term, 20, 30, 40 years after. And then just all the things that we were just uh, thinking for um, such a long period after this, it came like a couple of years later. For example, you can see climate crisis. Uh, we were expecting that we would have horrific uh, f uh, natural phenomena like floods um, after 20 or 30 years, and it just came twice in the last four years. So it's, we, we live in a very unpredictable world, and we need to develop all globally our techniques in order to uh, see our future together. Mm. And if we think of the, re the region, you've mentioned a number of potential threats from the Israeli-Gaza uh, conflict. Of course, in recent times, one of the biggest uh, agendas uh, for Greece has been the regional economic uh, map. I'm um, thinking of the exclusive economic uh, zones, the EOS, etc. <coughs> My, is there a risk of a spillover from the uh, Israeli-Gaza conflicts and the uh, regional uh, alliances therein for that map of exclusive economic uh, zones when it comes to the exploitation of natural resources? There is a danger, to be totally honest, and we work very uh, hard in order to prevent any uh, spillover. What is happening is that um, the last four years, the Greek government tried to uh, make some huge uh, energy uh, shift strategies. 
uh, we have developed an own industry of renewable energy sources. And we're very proud to say today that 50% of our energy mix come from uh, renewable, mm -hmm. which is a huge step towards uh, energy sustainability. And on the other hand, we have developed a series of uh, routes uh, concerning all sorts of uh, energy supplies. For example, we have established a new LNG station and now we're hoping for a second to be uh, set up in the very near future. We have the interconnector with uh, Eastern Mediterranean. We have the Grezi interconnector with uh, Egypt. We have the uh, northern uh, tube. So we have a lot of disparity in our um, energy resources and uh, that allow us uh, to survive also the uh, uh, Russia-Ukraine uh, crisis. Um, the truth is that uh, now we're doing again a remapping of uh, our energy strategy. Uh, as you probably know, we had in mind a new route uh, which would start from India, the uh, new economic, uh, India economic route going from India to Middle East and then to Eastern Mediterranean and Greece. Now we have to revisit this, but we sp definitely we will uh, try to um, um, set this up. Um, so yes, there is a credible danger, and yes, we have to work very hard in order to prevent any sort of, of uh, change in the uh, energy situation. You know, we cannot afford a second huge blow after what happened with uh, Russia. Europe uh, uh, over relied on uh, Russian gas, and we suffered because of this. There was a tremendous energy crisis uh, in Europe in the last uh, 18 months. And I think that should be a good lesson for us. Uh, we need to reduce over-reliance and uh, over-dependence over -dependence and work on a national European energy autonomy. Let me move on, but I'm sure there'll be uh, questions on uh, these topics uh, coming from the audience. I must ask you, uh, though, um, you mentioned about a um, more pragmatic relationship uh, with Turkey and with uh, President Erdogan. President Erdogan is visiting Athens uh, shortly. Um, I wonder how much the focus is optimistic in terms of immediate bilateral relations, and I wonder what your assessment would be, for example, in terms of Cyprus and Erdogan's uh, position there. Would you see some amelioration and progress uh, for Cyprus? To start with Cyprus, I think um, that it's important that we uh, try to develop better relations with uh, Turkey. I think by improving our bilaterals, uh, that would only be beneficial for Cyprus as well. And we share this understanding also with the Cypriot governments, uh, with uh, whom we are in full uh, coordination. So um, the idea is that we try to improve our uh, bilateral relationship with Turkey in order to actually re-energize um, the uh, Cypriot issue. The truth is that we have a completely different approach when it comes to the Cypriot issue. For us, the two-state solution is a no-go. Uh, we cannot discuss about it. We stick by the uh, UN Security Council resolutions for a bi-zonal, bi-communal um, uh, state and we will keep on working on this. Um, now we have some evolution because the European Union has decided to, uh, active, to be actively involved in all steps of, of uh, the Cypriot issue. So this is a good sign and we're going to have a, a new special envoy, hopefully soon. Um, so we are hoping that there is going to be a new momentum uh, for the uh, Cypriot issue. Um, it's absolutely uh, unacceptable that we do have such a uh, separation on an island, uh, and I think probably now, alongside with uh, Israel and Palestine, is, uh, those are probably the two um, uh, regions where we have a, such a huge <coughs> split of uh, population. When people uh, all around the globe are trying to reunite, we have two places where people are, are just fighting uh, against each other. We cannot see this happening. So uh, on the other hand, what we expect from um, our uh, council on the 7th of December, when we are going to welcome the Turkish uh, delegation led by President Erdogan, I think at this uh, stage it's important to do some confidence building. 
because the truth is that um, the last few years we had our ups and downs. I would say downs and downs mostly. Not, we didn't have many ups, we only had downs, but we're trying to reverse this, this uh, momentum and to try and develop um, a, a better understanding between uh, the two countries. Um, now, as I mentioned, we emphasize on the positive agenda, which means that we try to come up with agreements and memoranda that would be win-win uh, uh, for both countries. And if uh, the, um, um, the landscape is improving, uh, we are hoping that we can just touch upon the uh, uh, great problem that we have with Turkey, and you intimated this, and I tried artfully to avoid it, but <laughs> you uh, came back against, uh, again, implicitly. Um, so yes, if things are going well, we are willing to also discuss our major dispute, which is the delineation of um, our uh, uh, continental self and the economic exclusive zone. This is a very difficult issue. First of all, because it's been a long-standing uh, dispute, uh, and it's a very technical issue. It's not mm. only a political issue, but it's mostly a technical issue, a legal mm. issue. Um, and uh, you know, Kevin, that at least from our side, we fully abide by international law. What we keep on saying is that the international law should be our yardstick when it comes to uh, the maritime zones delineation. Um, and on the other hand, um, there are other uh, states involved in the Eastern Mediterranean. It's uh, Cyprus, Egypt, Libya. Um, so it's a complicated issue. We, um, if, if you ask me, I think we should be bold enough to actually discuss uh, this issue. And this is our only dispute that could be brought before the, uh, an international tribunal. Uh, we're not there yet. We're, I would say that we're still rather far away from this. But the thing is that if we manage to solve this problem, which has been the long-standing problem of the two neighboring countries, I think we could secure a much calmer environment for the future generations. And this is going to be my intention. OK. Um, in my last five minutes before I open up to the, uh, the audience, let me move on to other aspects. One of the reasons why the International Institute for Strategic Studies said that uh, you're dealing with a region which is a strategic flashpoint is what they described as the retreat of the United States from the, uh, from the region. Now, of course, Kiriakos Mitsotakis uh, was invited by the Biden administration uh, and gave a um, what was uh, widely regarded as a fantastic speech to Congress, both houses of uh, Congress, a great honor. Um, but in 2024, uh, presumably you're beginning to uh, assess the risks or the difference made by a return of Donald Trump as, as president. Um, how disruptive do you think to the region might be a President Trump who says, what the hell, we shouldn't have anything to do with them. Let the, uh, uh, Donald Trump, uh, he admires str strong leaders. Erdogan is a strong leader. Um, he could, uh, Donald Trump could easily uh, retreat even further from the region. How much, uh, the serious question here really, is how much of a destabilizing factor do you think it would be if American foreign policy was to do less in the region and give less priority to the region, less attention to the region. I, I expected a much easier night. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are two layers that one could uh, um, actually respond uh, on this question. First, I think it's the international arena. Um, the truth is that uh, the United States are indeed a key actor when it comes to um, the um, um, international affairs. Tomorrow I'm going to be in Brussels to discuss with my uh, NATO colleagues. I think it's important that we had uh, a very strong unity over NATO and the European Union concerning both the uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine and uh, concerning the Middle East. It's important that the West uh, was almost unanimous 
in uh, its response. Um, so there is a danger, obviously, if uh, the United States decide to change their uh, fundamental policy. Um, I am concerned, obviously, but this is something for the American people to uh, decide, and uh, it would have been very far-reaching to actually discuss about this situation. What really concerns me, though, is uh, the domestic layer, which is uh, the institutional layer. Um, you know, I still can't um, put up with what I, uh, uh, what we all saw on the uh, 6th, 6th of January, um, 20, mm -hmm. 20... The attack on... The attack at the... Um, Congress. At the Congress. <laughs> Uh, uh, four years ago, uh, so uh, 2019. Uh, 6th of January, it was a horrifying day. And, you know, like, uh, at least with what we have conquered uh, in our uh, lives is that we abide by institutions and uh, we take some things for granted. And there is an a key concerning democratic institution and the respect of the electoral processes in uh, the West. And what I uh, saw was actually uh, a very uh, unexpected um, uh, vision of, of uh, things, and I wouldn't like to see that coming back again. And it was interesting because on the, on the very same day, six, I think it was also 6th of uh, January, we had the by-elections for the um, American uh, Congress. And we had um, the election for the two senators in Georgia. Yes. And you know Georgia is not exactly the type of progressive um, uh, state. Uh, and for the first time in the history of the United States, we had two congressmen of Georgia. The one was uh, an African American, and the other uh, was a Latino, I think. Yes. So we had a tremendous diversity issue coming up, um, and I thought that was a, a really good sign for, for the uh, future and for inclusiveness of the United States on, and of uh, the world altogether. And then at the very same day, we had all those incidents, and um, it is frightening, frightening for the institutions, I think, and uh, for democracy altogether. Okay, so the last topic from me, then uh, we have uh, covered a number of the big foreign policy uh, aspects, is uh, um, the European Union and enlargements. Uh, the European Commission has published uh, what it calls its enlargements package, uh, and it envisages uh, opening up uh, accession talks with Ukraine, Moldova, Bosnia, and candidate status for uh, Georgia. Uh, just, just briefly, if I may, two related aspects. One, enlarging the European Union to these uh, 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 countries. Um, how would you see the implications for, for Greece uh, specifically? But related to that, many have uh, viewed the enlargements of the European Union to yet more uh, states as requiring uh, changes to the European Union's institutional processes, the idea of, in, of uh, separate national vetoes. A number of think tanks uh, wrote a letter in Le Monde uh, a few days ago saying that uh, really the European Union can't carry on with having whatever it is, 27 plus national vetoes. It can't act uh, collectively uh, in a decisive uh, fashion. Uh, what would be Greece's view about uh, the desirability of uh, changing EU treaties? I really wonder what the questions will be. You haven't left anything outside, <laughs> no, outside this interview. Um, it, this is probably the most crucial institutional issue concerning Europe. I think it, it is of utmost importance how we see the future of Europe and how we see the uh, decision-making in uh, Europe in the uh, uh, near future. Um, first, concerning the enlargement, I think we're not very close to the enlargement. There are still uh, conditions and benchmarks that ought to be met fully for all countries. So 
Um, we need to respect all those uh, preconditions. I do not think that we need and should make concessions. Obviously, Greece, and I think most of the uh, EU member states, we all encourage the um, uh, uh, candidate member states to uh, join the European Union. We consider that the European, fam uh, the European family uh, will be clearly the new home for all those uh, countries, but um, I think we need to take a few more steps and uh, we will provide all necessary assistance um, to those countries. Some of the uh, member states are closer, for example, Bosnia and Herzegovina could be uh, relatively closer, whereas others are not that close. Uh, the truth is that we have to work hard in order to uh, make Europe um, a very solid uh, confederation. Uh, you know, we always envisage Europe not as a melting pot. We do not expect the countries to be melted in a single pot and take the shape of this uh, pot. We expect, it, we expect Europe to, to be a salad bowl with all the discrete elements being there. Um, uh, let's, call but, it, but, let's call it a Macedonian salad. A, a northern Macedonian salad. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, no. Um, I, I think it's important that uh, we try to preserve the member states' constitutional uh, identity. It's very important. Uh, we do not aspire to actually absorb the uh, smaller countries. And that takes me to your second part of the question, which is uh, uh, dramatically important, I think. And now we're actually discussing with uh, my colleagues in Europe about the new um, architecture in uh, Europe. You know, Kevin, and uh, you're much more experienced in this field than me, um, uh, the uh, veto right was associated to uh, the European Union exactly because we wanted the member states to actually maintain the core of their sovereignty. Uh, and we're still thinking, I think, uh, this way. We're not in a position to actually abandon our uh, sovereign right to uh, decide about core issues of, of uh, the state. And uh, we all know that the uh, European communities uh, essentially started as, a, as an economic project and then it went forward through the political project and the uh, foreign policy and security uh, policy project. But essentially, we remain at the mindset of, of uh, sovereign member states. And um, I think federation is still very far away. So the veto, I think, has not exhausted uh, its uh, raison d'etre. But on the other hand, um, it is also true that there are a lot of decisions that have not been taken, reasonable uh, decisions, that ought to have uh, been taken, and yet they have not been taken, exactly because there was a limited number of, of member states, or a single member state, uh, that prohibited uh, the decision-making process. So clearly, we need to revisit uh, the whole situation, yet we have to bear in mind that the veto right still remains the uh, most important defense right of smaller states. So we have to be very cautious when we're discussing this. And uh, if you allow me to jump into another international organization, the same rationale also applies for the United Nations, because the decision-making architecture in the United Nations, one might say it's obsolete because you know, in order to have a, a, a very significant decision taken, there must be unanimity among the uh, members of the uh, Security Council. Yet, when you have, for example, one uh, state in the Security Council which exactly opposes any sort of uh, decision, then there is stagnancy. So probably we need, again, to revisit the idea of, of decision making also uh, in the uh, United Nations, but we, I think we uh, have to take into account that we need to have a fair balancing between um, effectiveness of the international organization and uh, the respect of minority rights of all states. Okay, thank you. Um, 
We've attempted to cover quite a number of uh, topics, but I'm sure there's uh, gaps and I'm sure there's issues you would like to raise. I doubt it. I've got colleagues uh, with uh, microphones. I'm going to uh, invite you to put your uh, questions. If I may, because of the time constraint, can I please encourage you to go straight to the, uh, say who you are, and then go straight to the question, and then we can have more uh, questions covered. And please wait for the uh, microphone. Could we take the lady in the striped jumper on the aisle here, please? She looks Greek. <laughs> no, I'm not actually. My name is Leonardo. <laughs> Kalinichta is That's good. I learned this in good primary school. Good enough to provide you with citizenship. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you very much for your talk. My question is related to um, the position of Greece in, in the Middle East conflict. Um, in there, sorry? In the Middle, Middle East, East conflict. Middle East. Um, so 50% of the Palestinian Christians are, roughly 50% are members of the Greek Orthodox Church. However, in the position of the Greek Orthodox Church, the official position, it's not strikingly clear, and, and I don't really have the, the impression that it represents the body of its members, which are mostly Palestinians. Um, at the same time, they have such a crucial role, like in Bethlehem and the other important Christian sites in the region. Do you think that there is some set of potential that is maybe missed in, in emphasizing the role of Palestinian people and, and an important part of the population? OK, thanks. I'm going to take two more questions, if I may. Could you take the gentleman in the, uh, about the fourth row here? Uh, if you could come with the microphone to the fourth row. No, no, the fourth row. Oh, okay, thank you, sorry. Thank you. Um, do you believe uh, that this Mediterranean energy cooperation can act as a guarantor for peace in the Middle East? And what will be the role of Greece into that? Um, and should Greece capitalize on the trust of the Arab countries? and be more active in the field. Thank you. OK, could you just identify who you are, please? Uh, my name is Dimitrios Kavouras, and I'm a Chatham House fellow. Thank you. And could we take the gentleman on the end of the row here, please? Thank you. Uh, good evening. I'm Matija Djurovic, professor of law from King's College London. And I would like to have a follow-up question uh, connecting in, in connection to the role of the Greek Orthodox Patriarch in the Jerusalem in this very good relationship between Greek state and Israel. Because as the lady has mentioned, I mean, the leadership, with one or two exceptions, is Greek, where the followers are mostly kind of Arabs. But you know, what we have kind of witnessed recently was like the attack on this Agios Porphyrios, the monastery, where the archbishop himself is Alexios. He's like the Greek citizen from Western Peloponnesus. And then that's the first thing like, in connection with this. And second is also the eternal problem with the property of the Greek social party. I'm sure you follow with this Jaffa Gate Hotel and all the corrupted affairs of the previous Patria Irineos that actually really caused a lot of questions. I mean, how, what is kind of the opinion of you about that? Thank you very much. Okay. You could take a couple more. OK, let's take uh, two more. And uh, could we take the lady um, almost in the middle uh, with the beige jacket, yes? Thank you. Um, Professor, hi, my name is Melina Antoniadis. I'm a lawyer. Uh, Professor Featherston mentioned uh, the issue of the Parthenon sculptures, and you made several compelling arguments. You mentioned a cultural partnership between Greece and the UK, uh, the reunification of the totality of the sculptures from the museum to Greece, uh, agreeing to disagree, uh, which is a crucial uh, matter, and uh, that an agreement would not require a change in the current law. Um, these elements sort of you know, reflect uh, what has been proposed by uh, the campaign group, the Parthenon Project, um, which also proposed uh, the transformation of the Duveen Gallery into Hellenic Gallery and the establishment of a foundation which would oversee this cultural partnership between the two countries. So I was wondering what your thoughts were on this proposal of the Parthenon Project and whether you would endorse such a proposal. Thank you. OK, uh, we've got four nice, simple questions for you to answer. <laughs> Would you like to have a go? And you expect me to finish in like 17 <laughs> minutes, OK? Because I see that there are like tons of other questions. Yes, yeah, so, so if miraculously. We, if we could just have some brief answers, and then we'll get some more questions. Concerning the, the relationship between the Christian population and the Christian institutions in uh, uh, Middle East, 
for me, clearly, it's not a matter of, of uh, religion what is happening. And we have to completely differentiate the religious aspect from uh, the humanitarian aspect in the Middle East. Uh, obviously, we had a, um, a tremendous attack uh, against Agios Porfirios, and we had the loss of lives in Agios Porfirios, but uh, it's, you know, like, I, I would have said the same thing if uh, it was a Muslim mosque. It's, uh, I think what we need to focus now is the issue of um, the end of this war and the uh, humanitarian aid to those in need. Um, we cannot discuss, I think, at this very moment concerning what is happening in the patriarchate. We are going to discuss all those issues as well as the issues of accountability stemming from uh, the Middle East crisis because there are some serious issues of accountability for, for what is happening now and it's absolutely unimaginable. We are discussing uh, now um, and, you know, like there are like more than 15,000 uh, people um, that have already uh, been killed. 70% of them are women and children. And, you know, like it's, it's really difficult for me to discuss from a religious point of view what is uh, happening. What I really think it's uh, of utmost importance and um, I would do anything in my power uh, to actually operate as an interlocutor is to stop this uh, nightmare. It is a nightmare and I think uh, all the, um, um, all, well, everything that we have seen in, uh, in this war is uh, beyond any imagination. We have seen uh, cruelty and inhumane treatment and uh, degrading uh, treatment um, that we haven't seen for, for, for decades. It's uh, really amazing. So um, yes, there is a very clear cut answer. I am going to exercise all my powers uh, in order to try and mitigate uh, the spillover and to actually assist with the uh, ceasefire. Um, and I'm going to operate as an interlocutor, not myself personally, but institutionally as a foreign minister of uh, Greece. And I will use all my uh, channels towards uh, all parties, all key actors, in order to try and find a sustainable solution and the sustainable solution uh, should be a direct humanitarian aid we need to increase the entry points to gaza uh, because now there is only one entry point um, in uh, uh, southern gaza through rafa which is totally inadequate so we need to have further entry points we have uh, also to uh, re-entry all the uh, necessary uh, facilities and equipment in order for the uh, water plants and the energy plants to operate smoothly and we need to allow for medical personnel. Uh, and then to speak about the um, a permanent solution to the Middle East problem. And um, for the uh, energy stability, obviously, uh, we work very hard for this. And we, uh, we are going to work even harder uh, for this purpose. Um, I, um, I had some good news a couple of days ago that uh, our uh, interconnector with uh, Egypt has been approved by the European Union as uh, a key project for uh, Europe. So it will be funded by European funds. And this will secure energy autonomy and sustainability for uh, Greece through Egypt. Um, and finally, yes, we are in discussion with the Parthenon projects. And obviously, we endorse uh, all the uh, ideas of, of uh, the people involved. You know, there, there are a lot of, of people and organizations working for the reunification of uh, the Parthenon sculptures. And I think this momentum will pile up. And um, I think it's important at this very moment that people in the United Kingdom are strongly in favor of the return of uh, the sculptures. It's the first time, mm. I think, in the British history that we have a good 63% of uh, people who actually declare that they would like to see the, Parthen the Parthenon sculptures going back to uh, their motherland. 
And I think this is something uh, really important and fascinating, and I would like to thank those people. Uh, because, it, again, I will say this, it's not a bilateral issue. For me, it's an ecumenical issue that uh, artifacts that have exercised such a huge influence upon, upon the global civilization, they should be in their motherland. That's it. As simple as this. Good, thank you. Let's take another round of oh. questions. <laughs> this is striking. We're, we're going to finish just before midnight. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, this a lady against the wall with a, a white top. What are your criteria of selection? <laughs> check your phone. You might check your phone. Sorry? You might check your phone. I can't hear. Uh, check. Your phone. Your phone. The PM has just cancelled the meeting tomorrow with the Greek PM. Oh. Because of the model. Okay. I'm sure the lady in white has got a highly topical question. <laughs> to, but before to that, let me, let me dive into the Turkish uh, relations. So I'm Aysu Bichar, a Turkish journalist for, for Anadolu News. So in a recent article for Parapolitika newspaper, you, you said that their bilateral relations have been improving since February. You also said that the government has a political agenda that will have confidence building measures in the defense and military dimension. So what specific uh, measures are being taken or should be taken in this regard and what challenges that the Greek government would face in the upcoming period. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not quite sure. I, 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 OK, what measures that should the Greek government to, oh, take? OK, good. Uh, the gentleman in white in the center here, please. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Michael Dikas, and I'm a postgraduate student at uh, Brunel University of London. Uh, Mr. Minister, first of all, I would like to thank you for your presence here and uh, the insightful conversation you had with uh, Professor Featherstone. Um, some years ago, uh, a previous Greek government signed uh, an agreement, the Agreement of Prespes, that uh, sparked great controversy within the country. Uh, your own party uh, objected it, and uh, there were even major protests in, in Greece. Uh, you said earlier that, uh, referring to the talks with Turkey, uh, as an unelected politician you are less affected or limited by political cost and you are willing to do whatever is needed for achieving what's best for the country. My question is how uh, do you as a politician deal with the dilemma of doing what you know is best or what you think is best and uh, or uh, what people uh, that you represent want. Thank you. Thank you. You forgot this. Sorry? You forgot uh, the, uh, yeah, the yeah, press uh, agreement. Absolutely. It's been one of the many topics I forgot. Can we take the gentleman right at the very front here, in the middle? Thank you. My name is Stefanos. I'm a, a graduate here, so I'm graduating in, in a month. Um, Good luck. <laughs> so, uh, Prime Minister Sunak just cancelled the meeting with uh, uh, <laughs> Prime Minister Mitsotakis uh, because of comments that the Prime Minister made about the marbles. Uh, what's your position on this? <laughs> I, I will go anyway. <laughs> I'm not going to make any comment about Prime Minister Sunak at all. Uh, there's a, a guy in the blue. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Jason. I'm an undergraduate law student here at the LSE. Um, last week, we saw another far-right government being elected in Europe, specifically in the Netherlands. I'm sure you've seen that. Um, whose main talking points, I would say, is hardline anti-immigration and hardline anti-EU, Euroscepticism. So, considering that Greece will inevitably be at the forefront of the EU migration crisis for years to come, how do you aim to cooperate with such hardline anti-immigrationist and anti-EU integration parties? Okay. That's a tricky one. We'll have to um, let you take some uh, the time to respond uh, to those uh, 
Do you want to uh, start with a question about Prime Minister Sunak uh, <laughs> finding other intellectual delights and uh, not being able to meet uh, Prime Minister Mitsotakis? I'm sure Prime Minister Sunak must have other more important things to do, apparently. You're asking me? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> what is your opinion? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have responded in like 1,000 questions and I only ask one okay, question. Okay, <laughs> okay. okay. I, my personal opinion would be that the Greek government should be patient because uh, uh, in recent times the uh, personnel of the British government has been changing <laughs> uh, quicker, quicker than the weather. So. Uh, just, just wait, and it's like waiting for a London bus. There's another prime minister coming along uh, pretty, pretty soon. Uh, some, uh, some hope. Um, there's a question about Turkey. Do you want to re respond to that? <laughs> Look, um, concerning the cancellation of the meeting, I, I cannot say whether uh, the cancellation was due to the uh, sculpture's question uh, mm. or not, so I cannot comment on this. What I have to say, though, is, again, that it's a matter of principle that we discuss with people and that the governments discuss about things. Uh, I cannot accept that uh, an issue, no matter how delicate it is, or no matter whether this is a burdensome issue, this should be out of, of, out of the agenda. It's uh, an important thing. It was not the one and only thing uh, that we came here to discuss. Uh, we had a very strong agenda, and we discussed with uh, many people, economic actors. We also saw the um, uh, chief of the uh, opposition in parliament. Um, and we discussed about economy, about security, about migration, which is a, a huge challenge also for the uh, United Kingdom, about the bilateral relations. We had a series of discussions uh, to make about um, the, our two countries. So I do not think that uh, it is legitimate to actually cancel on this ground. Again, I have to say, and I say this as a matter of principle, I am fully in favor of deliberative processes. I think we should just stay and discuss. And the truth is that we did it with the uh, British Museum for the last few years. And although we haven't as yet reached an agreement, there has uh, been made some progress. And it's important that we have made uh, progress. If Israel and Hamas are discussing, I think uh, Mitsotakis and Tsuna could discuss as well. <laughs> now, um, you see, I never say uh, no to respond to a difficult question. You have to credit me for this. <laughs> we do. So, press pay agreement. Skila and Harim is here. Um, <laughs> I have a very straightforward answer. Uh, the political party I represent was against this agreement. And it was against um, in a specific parts of uh, the agreement concerning uh, language and nationality. And I think there was a legitimate ground to actually have uh, a, a, an opposite view of, of uh, the agreement. Uh, in any case, uh, this agreement has been ratified by the Hellenic Parliament, and it has now become uh, law of the country. And as you probably know, uh, once an international treaty is ratified by the domestic parliament, it supersedes any other domestic legislation. So even if we wanted to change this law, we cannot do this. So we have fully to respect um, the uh, Prespe agreement, what we have to do is to be mindful of uh, how the agreement is uh, implemented, and we are mindful. We're uh, working very closely, and I uh, also talked to my uh, North Macedonian counterpart about uh, a series of, of, of uh, things relating to the implementation of the PRESPA agreement. Uh, but as I mentioned, this government, and me personally, 
we abide by all institutions, no matter what. Even if we disagree, we still stick by the institutions. And we're not going to do any sort of uh, unconstitutional practices just out of uh, ideology. So the Prespa Agreement will be uh, implemented. And we hope that this, uh, it will be implemented properly. That's the uh, answer. Now, um, Turkey. Turkey. Uh, the confidence building measures relate to uh, military exercises, mostly military exercises, and the uh, mitigation of uh, their power and their extent. So um, it is uh, our uh, military uh, chiefs discussing. For the first time, Greece has uh, appointed a diplomat, so uh, someone coming from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, to actually lead the confidence building uh, measures discussion. Uh, and we would like to see the, the calmness and tranquility over the Aegean uh, to be extended. Because you know, after February, uh, after last February, for now about eight months, uh, essentially we have uh, no violations of our airspace, uh, very few violations. And uh, we um, uh, have a, a much better uh, situation, uh, because if you do not have violations of the airspace, you do not have increased risk of uh, being engaged in uh, some fatal inc uh, incident. So um, it is very important to keep this calmness. And what I uh, keep on saying is that irrespective of whether we resolve our basic issue concerning delineation of the maritime zones, it is by itself important to extend the period of uh, calmness over the Aegean for as long as we can. So this is definitely an asset for uh, our discussion. And I can see that there are some, some uh, people and groups in uh, Greece, and I'm sure there are in Turkey as well, who are opposing uh, the idea of this idea of rapprochement between uh, the two countries. I respect it, by the, but I respectfully disagree. Uh, we have to live together, and we have to work hard in order to live in peace. Um, and I think it's much better to be able to mitigate the risks of, of uh, uh, a tension or a war, instead of trying to accelerate such a process. And uh, I think this is my responsibility towards the uh, Greek citizens, and especially towards the future generations. And finally, I'm very concerned with uh, what is happening in Europe uh, concerning uh, extreme political parties. Uh, in general, um, the Dutch people decided we have to respect the uh, outcome of the Dutch elections, and this is exactly what we're going to do. Uh, now, obviously, this poses some problems concerning the unity of the European Union, because um, in the, pre in the uh, political agenda of, of uh, uh, the now governing party, there was a very Eurosceptic approach. But we're very uh, hopeful that this will uh, change. Uh, now, concerning migration, uh, we have done some extremely tough work when it comes to the uh, migration pacts of the European Union. It took us about three years to conclude to a, migrate, to a draft migration pact. And we will uh, uh, sustain uh, this pact. And I am uh, hopeful that this will proceed, because this is uh, to the benefit of, of uh, the European people. We have to stay together. We have to apply standards of uh, fair burden sharing. And we have to show solidarity to uh, the countries that uh, uh, are in need. And at the same time, we have to always apply our humanitarian standards. We have to provide humanitarian assistance to those in need. But on the other hand, we have also to apply some strict standards. I, um, I expected Kevin to ask me about our migration policy. Uh, but he's getting old, obviously. <laughs> um, from time to time, I hear accusations that our migration policy is very tough. I, I disagree with this. Our uh, migration policy has been uh, tough but fair. 
What we're doing now is we're trying to actually convert illegal entries to legal pathways because the truth is that we need migration. We have very low unemployment and we need my, the uh, migrants to work uh, in the field in uh, Greece. So we are trying to establish through bilateral agreements uh, legal pathways. We have a bilateral agreement with uh, Egypt, with Bangladesh, with other countries in order to take uh, migrants to come to Greece and uh, work, but on an orderly manner. This is important. And the last four years, what we have implemented is that we have treated a, uh, a huge uh, flow that, uh, we, uh, that we had, and uh, we had a tremendous uh, bulk of uh, cases pending for asylum. And we managed through orderly processes to actually reduce the migration flows by 90% and to accelerate uh, the asylum uh, granting uh, by 90%. So yes, we're very proud of our migration policy. If there are incidents which go against our humanitarian principles, those incidents will be thoroughly investigated. OK, I think it's time for the wine reception immediately outside this uh, theatre. Um, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Yorgos Yerapatritis very, very much indeed for covering so many different uh, topics. And as a token of our thanks, I know that you showed the LSE uh, security card uh, here. We'd like to give you uh, a small gift. Can you please thank our guest, Yorgos Yerapatritis?